I'm going to go over a few practice exercises for using the angle measurement equipment that we covered in the last video. If you haven't already, please check out the Pragmatic Contrology website where you're going to find the print for the part we're going to go over. You'll also find PDFs of the practice exercises and the questions to consider, as well as a worksheet to fill out as you're going along so that you can check your work. Maybe somebody else you know can check your work and compare it against the print. Um, so if you don't have this part, you know, I have the CAD model available on the website. You can uh, 3D print it. You can make it yourself if you like. Otherwise, just grab one that you have available that has some angles on it and um, get the print. And one thing that's not on the exercise, if, if you happen to have a part with a hole pattern, you know, this part has four holes in a pattern, equal spacing. Um, grab that and grab a caliper and we'll, we'll go through an exercise to verify that as well. Um, but uh, once you're ready, uh, we'll get started uh, measuring with, with the different tools we've covered. So the first one says, use the bezel, use the bevel protractor to measure the 40 degrees on uh, PMO2, and you need you may need to measure compound angles or use shot math depending on you know, what part you have versus how you're using it. So first of all, let's take a look at the oops, let's take a look at the print. So we'll zoom in on the 40 degrees, uh, which is right here, and it's being called off of the bottom surface relative to this angle. The reason it's called that way is the bottom surface here is datum B. So they want to control this angle off of this datum. The engineer uh, could have very easily called this angle here if they wanted to, or they could have extended this line out and called a 50 degree angle. Um, but this is the way the print's called out, so we're going to try to verify that 40 degrees. So. All right, we got our bevel protractor. Excuse me for a moment. All right, so we got our bevel protractor and we have our part and we're looking for a 40 degree angle from here to here. And I'm not really gonna be able to do that. Um, with this blade and this protractor, uh, maybe I can do it this way. Yeah, I sh you know what? I spoke too soon. Uh, it might be tricky. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna really like it. But let's try and do it with the bevel protractor directly. So I'm switching out the blade. And now I'm going to try and get, eh, it's not too bad. Normally I would clamp this and take a look at the angle. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to do that. Um, get a nice firm registration, clamp it down. It's kind of hard to do on camera, but let's see what we got. 41, I'm gonna double check that. It's a little bit bulky. Try to do this off camera, a little closer to my body. All right, and let's bring it up to the camera. There we go. Looks like 40 to me. If you can't see it on the TV monitor um, next to me, take a look at this camera feed right here, but it looks pretty good. Um, some other ways we could have done that. Um, well, I'm gonna change back to the smaller blade. Some other ways we could have done that measurement. Clamp you in, rotate you around. Could have come off of the top surface, in which case, look, I'm reading, I'm reading 40 again, um, slightly off. 
I think I'm having trouble holding everything and showing it on camera, but... Now, one of the reason I don't like doing this method coming off of the top surface here, this is not what the print said. The print wants it off of the bottom surface. There's no guarantee that these two are parallel to each other. So a measurement off of this surface relative to this angle doesn't quite help us unless we set this up on a surface plate, run an indicator across here to verify that it is parallel, in which case we will be able to trust the measurement. But otherwise, uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to to try and get it off of the bottom surface. So this is another example of where it's a little bit, as you saw me, it's a little struggling. The the thing, you know, the the two surfaces don't actually meet at a point. They meet off in space, so that makes it a little trickier. I could have also done it off of this angle, this surface, in which case I should get 50 degrees. Okay, 50 degrees. Uh, you see that on the monitor? Uh, where that zero lines up, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, again, we don't know that this surface is parallel, or sorry, perpendicular to this surface. Again, it's not something we know. It's called off of this surface, so I'm, I want to get a direct reading if I can. Um, otherwise, we just got to do a quick verification. This is parallel. This is perpendicular. But that's a few options for you. Let's go back to our exercise list. So, um, shot math might have been yeah, going from 90, you know, using compound angles, using 90 degrees or using 180 degrees. Um, it depends on, um, on what you're doing. And what I actually did not do, 180 degrees kind of remind me, I did not verify the condition of the gauge but I did that in the last video which I just recorded so um, you want to um, periodically verify that you are reading zero by putting it on a calibrated surface plate before you get started so don't forget that step like I did um, but sometimes these go out of condition and you'll need to repair them um, number two let's see let's uh, you know looking at the angularity requirement uh, 5 thousandths relative to B, set it up on a sign bar, um, and uh, rest the part on the sign bar, uh, run a test indicator across the surface to look for 0 0.005 maximum TIR. So we did this in the video, I'm going to do it again in the training video, I'm going to do it again for this exercise. Let's take a look at our print again. So we have an angularity requirement, 5 thousandths relative to datum B, which is the bottom. So we're gonna set up our sign bar. And to do that, we're gonna to need to know a Joe Block stack to build. And I've done the math for you here using a sign table. You can find this sign table on the Pragmatic Metrology website, or many others are available. And if you don't wanna use a sign table, you can just use a calculator and calculate the sign of 40 degrees yourself. So the sign of 40 degrees is 0.64279. And I'm using a five inch sign bar. And what it, once again, I'll remind you, it's from the center of each pin, not the overall length of the sign bar, but from the centers of the pins. And you're probably gonna see five inches, 10 inches or 12 inches. Those are the only ones I've come across. Um, so five inches is most common, it's a good size. So five times 0.64279, becomes 3.21395. And because it ends in a five and continues on, I'm gonna round up to 3.214 and build a stack at 3.214. So to do that, we will, uh, we will build our Joe Block stack and I'm gonna need a, a three inch, a 0.1 and a 0.114. And I've got the surface plate video where I talk about how to how to figure out that uh, calculation, to figure out which blocks you can use, how to assemble them as I'm showing you on this video, um, sliding them together and building a perfect stack with no air, no chips, no oil, 
held together just by vacuum, right? Um, when you get when you get heavier blocks, don't 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 let them hang off the way I am right now with these tiny ones. But with these uh, 0 0.1 and 0.14, this uh, 0.114, this overall stack is 3.214. So now I'm gonna securely put it on the sign plate. Set up my sign bar. Gonna bring over my indicator. I'm gonna be using a height gauge for convenience. And I've gotta clear the camera. So I've gotta play around with our positioning a little bit. All right. So I should have the sign bar at a 40 degree angle. I have my height gauge set up. I'm gonna take our part and rest it on the sign bar. Get, make sure everything's secure. And now we're ready to run our indicator across the part very carefully. Careful not to knock anything over, especially when you're working with a small sign plate. Things tend to get a little cramped. I've got a little bit more room, so I'm going to slide this just a bit so we can get it in camera. All right. Um, slide it a tiny bit more so we can see the indicator. All right. So I'm going to zero at one corner and you can probably just do it by touch. There we go. Um, looks like zero. Camera might have a little parallax error, but from my, uh, from my perspective, the, the indicator is on zero. And we're just gonna watch for the movement as I, as I run it around. I'm not seeing a whole lot of movement. I'm trying to get all surfaces, being careful not to Drop this. I'm, I'm hanging off the edge a little bit, but otherwise, I'm not seeing the indicator move all that much. There's a little bit of movement down here on the last edge, maybe a half a thousandths. But if you check out this video here, it's a little clearer, and you'll see there's there's not a lot, a whole lot of movement. So this part was machined uh, pretty good, um, pretty flat at the right angle. Not a lot of chatter. It's very smooth to touch as well. So I had five thousandths of air um, tolerance and I had about 0.5 thousandths of actual measurement air on the TIR. When you're done, you know, just gently disassemble your stack and return your Joe blocks to the holder. And that's how you use a sign bar. So Okay, let's move on to the next exercise. Um, attach a bevel protractor to a height gauge and measure the 40 degree angle on the angle block. So you're gonna rest the part on datum B um, on, the, on the surface plate. You're gonna lower the height gauge until the blade, uh, until the blade makes contact, there it is. until the blade makes contact uh, with the part. And then you're going to take your reading. When you clamp it down, um, go ahead and take a reading. And if you want to make things a little bit more challenging, a little bit more realistic, if you don't have a big part, grab a couple of matched one, two, three blocks or just one and raise up your part. And then it'll make it a little more realistic. Uh, if you don't have a large part, you can simulate a large part this way. You get the distance, the angle from the surface plate to here using a height gauge. Now, as I mentioned in the training video for the height gauge and the bevel protractor, the clamp I have doesn't fit the bevel protractor I have. So I won't be able to demonstrate that. I think you guys can figure it out on your own. Just clamp it on and um, You just clamp your uh, your attachment on uh, using the clamp, and then as a 
just raise and lower it. That's all. It's, it's not that uh, not that challenging, not that difficult. And as you uh, lower it, you can um, you can slide the part into the blade uh, rather than lowering the blade down onto it. Um, what I have found works best for me is I will set uh, I will set the gauge um, kind of kind of clamped a little bit of close to the angle I want a little bit of resistance and then I will bring the the blade basically I will slide the part into the blade rather than lowering the blade down once I'll just make sure that it's down far enough that I can slide my part in and then I can loosen the clamp and really let it seat properly and clamp it back down and take our reading. So I wish I had that, I wish I had the correct clamp to get it all together, but um, all three manufacturers of height gauge clamp and uh, bevel protractor do not want to get along for me. So, but it's a, if you can get the same manufacturer that sells all this equipment, then it should be no problem. Um, number four, use a precision square to verify perpendicularity. So, we got a precision square. I'm going to measure some perpendicularity off of this surface, and you're just going to look for any light that appears. So, I'm going to register on one surface and then bring the other one in, and you should see no light from the bottom. But you might see some light when you hold it up, you know, hold it up into something kind of bright. And you might see something, which I do. I see a little bit of error when I, when I actually hold it up to a light. So not, not the most precise, but gives you a quick reading. You'll know if something's good or something's wrong fairly quickly. When I do it this way, I don't really see a whole lot of error registering here and checking here, which leads me to believe maybe the machining process was set up such that these two were were going to be perpendicular uh, set up to be perpendicular but these two were not i mean that's that's a possibility sometimes it looks perpendicular and you rotate your parts and you assume everything's rotating correctly but in the end there's a little bit of error in some surfaces and there's none in others just because of the way you set it up and the order of operations that you chose but it doesn't really matter for an inspector. It's got to be in print. So um, this is a, a quick way to check it. A better way to check it would be uh, set up a height gauge again. This is a more of a, a GD&T check I'll, I'll show you. But um, if your part has a perpendicularity call out, uh, GDNT perpendicularity. You can set up an indicator just like we've done a bunch of times. And we'll set our indicator. Oops. Tried to avoid hitting the camera and I finally did it. So we'll set up our indicator at a At a vertical orientation, you can tell from the camera here, this is set up vertically and not um, horizontally. Bring this down, and let's see. Let's see how much perpendicularity error exists between, um, let's do it this way, datum B and datum C. So bring my indicator in, zero it. Apply a little pressure from above and let's go. Just raising it up. And our indicator is moving. I'm sorry, the monitor here kind of washes it out, but the, the, the feed here shows that it moved eh, about two and a half, almost three thousandths. You can see the indicator kind of walking back and forth as I go up and down. So there's a little bit of error, not too much. Now the reason we uh, we don't need to necessarily do this is the print doesn't call for that. The print is just calling for you know 90 degrees is implied, uh, but there's no specific call out. It's a good check to do. 
um, especially because I saw a little issue with my with my machine is square. I did see a little issue, but um, not seeing a big issue with my indicator. It's within our it's within our title block tolerance. So um, let me get this out of the way. All right. So that's it for our exercises that are um, on the on the up here on the screen. I do want to give you one more if you found that part with a whole pattern. Just verify the whole pattern symmetry with your caliper and try multiple ways. Um, you know, try, you know, if you've got a center hole, an outside diameter, and a whole pattern relative, go ahead and try, you know, from the inside. There we go. 235s, 236s, and then try from the outside. 79, 80, 80, 79. Try, try cross holes if you've got an even number of holes. 785, 785. Try in between holes. 509, 509, 509, 510. Um, but you know, try some different options using inside and outside. You can even you can even use the uh, the inside jaws in some cases and verify symmetry that way. So just practice verifying symmetry. Think about the situations where you could um, benefit from it. Sometimes even milled parts will have some symmetry, you know, between maybe these holes. But it wasn't it wasn't designed that way, but if it were designed that way, you could still, if you had, you know, symmetry in your holes, you could still go about this way. But these, all these holes are different sizes and different locations, so it's not going to work for this practice part. But you may have a milled part that it does work for. Um, my gyroscope frame there on the on the desk there has a symmetrical pattern that it might work for. So um, sometimes you can do it off of edges. You know, you can verify symmetry off of edges as well. That would be uh, when you have milled parts and they have whole patterns, sometimes that, that's just the way they're intended and you can verify it that way as well. So um, let's, let's verify or let's discuss a few uh, questions to consider. Uh, after you've done this practice exercise, watch the videos. Um, so what do you think about using the bevel protractor for angle measurements? What problems or challenges does the tool require you to control? So think about that and I'll give you some of my opinions. I really like it. I think it's very accurate the way this, um, you know, these, these blades are precision ground. It's pretty smooth rotation. It's easy to control. The, the reading is blown up. This, um, the scale that you're reading is, is easy to, pretty easy to read because of it. Now some of the challenges, it can be hard to get the the anvils registered smoothly. You, know, you have to apply pressure um, with some more challenging ones. Sometimes reading this can get tricky. You know, it's um, when you're around 45 degrees and you're dealing with compound angles, you don't necessarily know, are you making a direct measurement? Are you making a compound measurement? Um, so you have to watch for parallax error with some styles, this gauge. This gauge isn't so prone to parallax error. It, it's not um, an overlapping layers type of gauge, but some of these are. So you have to watch out for those uh, situations. You have to make sure your, your, you know, your clamp is good and that you're not going to interfere with, with, the, with the stubs here um, that, that could uh, cause you to, to verify to miss everything, but otherwise um, it's a good gauge. Um, number two, what challenges did you experience with the sign bar? What might be difficult about using the sign bar to measure uh, the 40 degree angle? And I say what most people do is they, they measure the, they calculate the stack height wrong because they calculate the stack height wrong or they grab the wrong Joe blocks. They don't get a 40 degree angle and um, they end up with a bad measurement, but it's actually a fairly simple 
exercise to do a subtraction measurement. Um, you have to be kind of handy with a height gauge, you know, but we didn't do anything that was too challenging with it. Um, so I like it. I do it a lot. I set up a sign bar a lot because I think it's a very good method for verifying angularity or even just quickly verifying some angles that don't require angularity. Um, it's still a good subtraction measurement. Number three, um, did your height gauge attachment uh, measurement correlate to using the bevel protractor as a hand tool? So when you attach the bevel protractor to the height gauge, did you get the same reading as you got with a uh, hand tool only when you're measuring your, your angle? And what factors may be a problem for this setup? Uh, as I mentioned in the training video, there's a few things you need to be aware of. First of all, if your height gauge is out of perpendicularity between uh, the bottom surface plate and the travel up and down, if this is not perpendicular, that will affect your angle measurement. So you need a, you need a calibrated height gauge uh, for this situation. And um, if you've got any chips, you know, when you're setting it down and you rub it around and there's chips underneath, that will also affect this. So you need a clean surface plate, a clean height gauge. And, you know, sometimes the amount of travel, there's more air introduced the more you travel. Even with a good height gauge, um, as I talked about in the surface plate videos, the more you travel, the more air you introduce. So you might see a difference if you had to travel a large amount. But theoretically, you know, the angles should not matter how far you're traveling, but um, in reality, it, it could a, a little bit because you get a little air as you move. Um, and then you need to make sure your part is sitting securely if you had it in some sort of fixture or um, resting badly. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward measurement. You don't need, to, don't need to worry too much about it as long as you're using good practices. Uh, number four, what do you think of the machinist square? Or do you think the machinist square is an adequate tool to measure the perpendicularity uh, of PMO2? What other tools have we covered that could do the job? As a hint, you know, GD&T lecture, surface plate tools. I pretty much demonstrated the hint for you. You can do it with an indicator and a height gauge. Um, and do you think it's accurate enough for verifying the tidal block tolerance? You know, unless it's called out differently on the print, uh, verifying the tidal block tolerance, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good enough tool. If you see light, uh, set up another verification. If you don't, then you should be all right. Um, Again, you're, if something's called out specifically on the print, that's a different story. But if it's the title block call out, you can verify it. Most people will be satisfied verifying with this. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in a traceable situation where you really actually need to report the perpendicularity, then you probably won't be able to use this unless it's a calibrated gauge and your, your system allows for it. Um, most systems don't go to that level of detail that I've seen, but um, you're more than welcome to use it as a quick check, especially on the production process. And then um, for that fifth, you know, we did an exercise with the whole pattern. I just want you guys to consider, you know, when can you use it? When can't you use it? Um, what do you think of it? And I'd say, I, you know, I've, I've said it before, I like it. You can use it when symmetry is implied, and you can't use it when holes are different sizes um, or different, or they're not in a symmetric pattern. You're not going to be able to verify symmetry if they're not the same size, they're not the same angles. So, but otherwise, for a lot of open tolerance clearance situations, for bolts to go through holes, even tapped holes, um, it, it's a good enough check to verify that that the part will function and is, is within tolerance. So um, when you start needing tighter tolerance, true position, you may need to set up better situations. You can't use a caliper, you may have to use a CMM or a height gauge, but um, open tolerance situations, it's, it's more than adequate. So thank you for watching this training video. 
Um, please check out the other training videos um, for exercises and for um, more gauges and more resources to help you like that sign table. And I want to, again, I want to quickly thank the Laney College for providing me this part to use. Um, they have a great program. They offer a lot of classes in manual machining, CNC machining. The machine technology department um, offers um, apprenticeship uh, help. They offer certificates in metrology and machining. They offer um, associate's degree as well if you take enough classes. So if you do any of that, you're going to be a, a very good setup for your career. You'll be a leg up on a lot of people in the industry. So I um, recommend you check out uh, Laney Community College in Oakland. If you're in the Northern California Bay Area, they have a great program. And, um, and I want to thank you guys for watching and I hope you check out uh, my other videos. Thank you.